Good morning. The Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will now come to order. The, uh, today, the subcommittee is holding a hearing entitled the Clean Future Act and Drinking Water Legislation to ensure drinking water is safe and clean. Due to the COVID-19 public health emergency, today's hearing is being held remotely. All members and witnesses will be participating via video conferencing as part of our hearing. Uh, microphones will be set on mute for purposes of eliminating an inadvertent background noise. Members and witnesses, you will need to unmute your microphone each time you wish to speak. Documents for the record can be sent to Rebecca Tomlicek at the email address we've provided to staff. All documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of today's hearing. I uh, now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Last week, Ranking Member McKinley and I were able to participate in the Bipartisan Policy Center's American Congressional Exchange Program. Mr. McKinley was kind enough to host me in West Virginia for a few days, and thank you, David. And I really appreciate all the hospitality he showed me as I tried to better understand some of the challenges facing our constituents, and in this case, his constituents. I will not pretend that a short visit will solve all of our disagreements, but it indeed was an eye-opening. Uh, one thing that we consistently heard was the need for infrastructure investments, and this subcommittee can play a critical role in supporting our nation's struggling water systems. Today, we will consider some 10 bills, including several Republican-led and bipartisan bills, to support the infrastructure, safety, and affordability of our nation's drinking water. I always am quoted with, every life and every job depend on access to clean drinking water. As we consider how to make our economic recovery robust and equitable, supporting our long neglected water systems must be a cornerstone of that effort because the needs are indeed immense. In its 2021 report card, the American Society of Civil Engineers graded the nation's drinking water infrastructure at C minus. And the EPA's 2018 needs survey estimated that an investment of over $472 billion is required to maintain our drinking water systems over the next 20 years. So every member of this subcommittee should be accustomed to local news reports of water main breaks, boil water advisories, and service disruptions. And a few members are sadly all too familiar with major contaminations from lead, from PFAS, and other serious threats to public health. We have 700 main breaks every day on average. We lose 6 billion gallons of treated water through leaks every day. And there are hundreds of thousands of schools and children facilities delivering water through uh, lead components to uh, American children every day. This is unacceptable. And Congress knows that it is unacceptable. In recent years, there have been bipartisan efforts to increase federal assistance to local water systems, but the needs have continued to grow. And the financial stress on local governments and their water customers have only become more acute due to the COVID-19 pandemic. President Biden's American Jobs Plan recognizes this massive need and includes $111 billion for drinking and wastewater infrastructure, including fully replacing every lead service line and addressing PFAS. The Clean Future Act invests $105 billion over 10 years for our nation's drinking water systems, including $53 billion for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, $45 billion to fully replace lead service lines, and $5 billion to provide assistance to systems with PFAS contamination. Other proposals under consideration today seek to address near and long-term affordability challenges and support financially distressed water systems. And the Aqua Act, which I introduced, would make it easier for EPA to set national standards for emerging contaminants like PFAS in the future. This is what today's bills are about, making our drinking water safer, more reliable, and more affordable, protecting our children from lead exposure at their homes and their schools, and ending the threat of having water service shut off amid this prolonged public health crisis. These are not controversial things. They are fundamental government services that today local governments are struggling to provide. If you do not believe that the federal government should be stepping up 
and doing its fair share for this essential infrastructure, what exactly then should we be doing? So I hope today can be the beginning of a conversation that allows us to find consensus that will deliver the assistance needed by our local communities and constituents to address their water needs. I certainly welcome Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer McLean from the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water to this subcommittee. We look forward, Doctor, to your perspective on these bills and our nation's drinking water issues broadly. And we look forward to working with EPA to refine these proposals as they move forward in the House. With that, again, welcome to the subcommittee and to all, let's uh, have an engaging conversation on water infrastructure. With that, I will um, recognize uh, Representative McKinley, uh, the ranking member of our subcommittee on environment and climate change for his opening statement for five minutes, please, David. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, I, I get a kick out of it. You know, as a civil engineer, the only licensed civil engineer in Congress, I get a kick out of the fact that, that our committee and others keep referring to the ASCE report. So let's just, let's just keep working on that, Paul. And I, I think it's the right thing. And thank you again for your opening remarks about coming to visit in West Virginia, because you had the chance to see firsthand in Wheeling how the, the using the state revolving fund, how they were putting in water lines uh, in our streets uh, in downtown. So you've seen the advantage of what's happened with it. So look, the, at my official remarks here primarily would be about our top priority that I'm finding whenever I go to one of my water districts, they're all, they're, their top priority is always about overcoming the associated costs with leaks and breaks in their lines. They're aging system. Maybe some of them are over a hundred years old. But keep in mind, Paul, as, as, you, as we talked about when you were here, this West Virginia is not unique. This is happening nationally. You already just mentioned 250,000 breaks, waterline breaks annually on it. It's 700 a day. Uh, now, according to the American Water, uh, uh, Water Works Association, we're losing, because of these breaks and, and leaks, we're losing as much as 30% of the water, 30% of the water that we treated. Uh, and that um, that amounts, as you pointed out, six billion gallons of water, lost water a day. That's that's costing utilities, the public service commissions, these these groups that are just so underfunded. That a total seven point six mil billion dollars is being lost that they can they can't get revenue for. They clean the water, but yet it's gone. Seven point six billion dollars. This is a six billion dollars. Six billion gallons is a huge amount of it. And that, think about that, Paul, that and for the whole committee, that amount of water we lose every year or every day is more than the entire continent of Africa has available for their water system. Think about that. The water that we waste is more than they have available for consumption in the entire continent of Africa. So just imagine the hardship that all these leaks are doing to our public service commissions and utility companies all across America. With 51,000 systems, it can't be efficient to, to be losing 30%. 30% is not acceptable. Imagine if we lost 30% of our oil and gas in the pipelines, if we leaked that. With, or imagine with post offices, if they lost 30% of the mail. We've got to stop this. And according to the American Water Works Association, we're going to need two or 1.7, almost two trillion dollars through 2050 to repair this infrastructure. And at the rate we're, we're helping our communities, our, these public services, it will take over 100 years to catch up. So my, my point, Mr. Chairman, is why is Congress nibbling around the edges on this? That's, that we're, we're passing bills to just whistle past the graveyard about these issues. Leaks and breaks cause heartaches. They're breaking the backs of our financials uh, of our public service commissions. They simply don't have the financial resources to do this. So, and, and if you look back on it, President Obama initially requested four billion dollars in his state revolving fund when he came to office. But then gradually he reduced that money down to less than two billion dollars. And when we asked that, if you remember you know, Tonko in the in the committee, when Gina McCarthy said that reason she did that they made the reduction and said because our priorities have changed and that the funding differences should be used for climate change initiatives like pamphlets literature educational so what i'm saying is where can we can congress identify the funds that we need maybe the money's already there congress has already signed multiple covid relief funds for our states 
We know that the states and local government have unappropriated funds sitting in their in their respective coffers. And clean water is a public health issue. So what we're saying, why don't we, as part of legislation, really be serious about this instead of nibbling around the mark? Why don't we allow the states, if they choose, to transfer some of this federal COVID money to their state revolving fund so that we can expedite these repairs without having to ask for more money? Everyone's the water mains will continue to break all across America and leaks are going to continue to occur over the next hundred years. Mr. Chairman, this is not a partisan issue. We talked about it in West Virginia and you and I came to America deserves better. I think we got a better plan than nibbling around the edges. Thank you. And I yield back my balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. And again, thank you, Representative McKinley, for an enjoyable time in West Virginia and uh, instructive also. Um, the chair now recognizes the uh, chair of the full committee, uh, Representative Pallone, for five minutes for his opening statement. And again, thank you for the assistance on this issue, Chairman. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. I want to thank you for your longstanding leadership on drinking water issues and for calling this hearing because access to safe Drinking water is essential to our health and prosperity as a nation. And unfortunately, it is far from guaranteed. I know our the ranking member said that as well. And like many aspects of our lives, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown just how important and how fragile that access to safe drinking water is. We have aging infrastructure. We have tight state and local budgets, family budgets stretched to the limits, and climate change. These are all making the situation worse. But fortunately, the legislation we're considering today can help. The president has called on us to invest $111 billion in our nation's water infrastructure, investments that can create good paying jobs, protect public health and strengthen communities. And the bills before us could deliver the investments and benefits envisioned in the president's American job plan and long supported by members of this committee. We'll discuss legislation from both sides of the aisle that would extend important drinking water programs, including the state revolving fund, as well as water resiliency, school drinking water, and tribal uh, water programs. We have multiple bills before us to address customer water debt, including a bipartisan bill that would establish permanent rate assistance programs to help low-income customers pay their water bills. And we'll discuss legislation from both sides of the aisle that would deliver the funding called for in the American Jobs Plan to replace all lead service lines nationwide. The Clean Future Act, which I introduced earlier this year with Chairman Tonko and Rush, invests $45 billion over 10 years to replace all lead service lines. It also prioritizes replacing the lines in disadvantaged and environmental justice communities. And our states and water systems are trying to do the right thing to find lead service lines and replace them. And I look forward to hearing from the EPA today on how the agency and Congress can help states and water systems get it done. In the past, we have had great success on this committee of coming together to pass funding for drinking water infrastructure. Unfortunately, we've made less progress coming together to strengthen drinking water standards and ensure safer drinking water uh, for all based on those standards. So I hope we've reached a turning point in that effort. Bipartisan support for strengthening protections against lead and PFAS can point the way towards greater consensus on strengthening the law to provide safer water for all. At last year's hearing on standards setting under the Safe Drinking Water Act, I noted that almost all of our drinking water standards were set before the 1996 amendments to the statute, and the standards that have been set since then have all been done under special statutory provisions. So the end result is that over the last 25 years, EPA has never managed to complete the general standard setting process called for under the Safe Drinking Water Act. But I, and I hope we can agree that that's a problem. Some of the bills before us would set deadlines for specific drinking water standards, carving a path for health protective standards for PFAS, microsystem, and uh, one, uh, one fish for dioxane. The Aqua Act, which you chair, which you uh, sponsored, Chairman Tonko, and you mentioned it, would go further and take steps to fix the standard setting process for all contaminants. The narrow changes in that bill could make a huge difference for communities across the nation. And I hope we can be that can be part of the bipartisan work going forward. And over the last few months, I've often said that this moment of crisis provides us an opportunity to invest in our country, making it stronger, cleaner, healthier, and better off. Drinking water legislation is a clear example of that opportunity. Every family should be able to trust that the water coming from the tap is safe. In order to make that happen, we have to come together 
to enact real improvements to our drinking water system. So uh, again, I hope, I really appreciate what uh, you're doing here with this hearing and the bills. Um, you know, it's a question of having better standards so that the water itself is, is uh, safe, but also providing the money so we can address the infrastructure. And both of those are part of what we're trying to accomplish today. So thank you again, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, the chair yields back. The chair now recognizes Mrs. Rogers, <laughs> Representative Rogers, serves as ranking member of the full committee. Thank you for joining us, uh, Representative. You're recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to all uh, and to our witnesses. Before I get to my remarks, I wanna say thank you, Mr. Chairman, for including the, the drinking water funding for the Future Act as part of this hearing. Helping our communities comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act, extending funding for approving proven programs, increasing purchasing power for drinking water systems, and bolstering techn technical assistance. These are the items upon which I think we all agree. These were the pillars of a very successful bipartisan drinking water package that became law in 2018. It can also be the formula for today. We must invest, invest in our children's future to win the future. But there's a difference between investing wisely and saddling our children with crushing debt. Last week, the Committee for a Responsible Budget stated that despite record low borrowing rates, interest payments on the federal debt will be over 300 billion this fiscal year. We must think about creative ways to solve these problems, not just write a bigger check. On today's bills, there are parts of each that sound appeal appealing, but taken as a whole, they divert us to a dangerous pathway. Just let me highlight three areas. First, the authorization amounts contained in many of these proposals. For instance, the, the drinking water revolving loan fund authorized is increased 400 to 500% of the last appropriation bill passed by the Democrat led house. I support the drinking water state revolving fund, but I'm concerned states cannot meet their matching requirements. And I see few practical benefits with pushing a number this high. Additionally, there's a $45 billion uh, uh, authorization for lead service line replacements for both poor and wealthy Americans, including their privately owned pipes. This amount is being pushed even though the EPA is yet to publish a needs assessment on the number of lead service lines and legislative pushes for lead line mapping. The second area of concern is the creation of new entitlement programs to pay off un, unpaid invoice, invoice, eh, invoices. Sorry, I and many of my Republican colleagues supported bipartisan legislation to help affected people pay their water bills during this pandemic, but they were targeted and temporary. These bills create open-ended programs that prevent future collection efforts for five years. Plus one of them creates the first ever entitlement program run by EPA. Moreover, these bills simultaneously require EPA to study the size and scope of the pro program while also pushing aid funding out the door, which seems a little backwards to me. Lastly, the, there are proposals to change regulatory requirements when EPA issues drinking water and underground injection rules that I find concerning. One proposal strikes requirements preventing EPA from issuing rules where the cost exceed the benefits and also removes variances for small systems, killing alternative, innovative, affordable means of compliance. Water itself may be, quote, free, but treated water is not, especially in towns like College Place, Washington, where they can't even afford the state revolving fund. We must sustain policies that prioritize finance, finance resources to address public health matters, including federal, state, local, or private ones. Once Congress commits those resources, they won't be there for the worst ones. Most importantly, these changes will place water systems into a spiral of debt, chronic non-compliance, or both, essentially pushing any non-urban or suburban system into consolidation under the terms of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Additionally, federal regulations on hydraulic fracturing an underground injection of carbon dioxide will not make water safer. It will, however, create a powerful disincentive for hydraulic fracturing and carbon capture, CCUS. This will make us less secure, more economically dependent going for, forward, whether from our government or foreign nations. 
and it could sideline emissions reduction technology. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to learning more about the EPA career staff's views on these bills. I wish we had other stakeholders here to weigh, on, weigh in on these provisions. Nevertheless, I thank you and I yield back the, the remaining of my time. You are welcome. The general lady yields back. Um, the chair reminds members that pursuant to committee rules, all members written open, opening statements shall be made part of the record. Now I will introduce uh, the witness for today's hearing. Um, as earlier mentioned, we're joined uh, by Dr. Jennifer McLean, Director of Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Dr. McLean, we appreciate the um, sharing of information today that will uh, enable us to move forward with the soundest policy. And so uh, we appreciate uh, your time uh, and your uh, information. I recognize Dr. McLean now for five minutes to provide her opening statement. And again, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Tonko, Ranking Member McKinley, and members of the subcommittee. I am Dr. Jennifer McLean, Director of the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water within the Office of Water at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about EPA's efforts to help ensure that all people in America have safe drinking water. Water is essential to life and to thriving communities, and our nation's drinking water systems deliver this vital resource, thereby protecting public health and serving as a cornerstone for economic development. We've seen a lot of progress since Congress passed the Safe Drinking Water Act. Currently, 93% of community water systems meet all health-based standards. Unfortunately, many of the systems that ushered in this progress are aging and their infrastructure needs repair or replacement. Water's importance has never been clearer than during the COVID-19 pandemic, which highlighted the essential need for safe water while putting unprecedented stresses on water systems and on the tens of millions of Americans that are struggling to afford their water bills. Tribal utilities and communities that lack reliable water infrastructure have been among the hardest hit. Our nation's water utilities have worked tirelessly to keep vital drinking water and wastewater services operating. And EPA has supported water utilities throughout the pandemic and recovery, including through infrastructure financing. EPA's water infrastructure programs have demonstrated time and again that they can improve public health and environmental protection while creating good paying jobs and laying a foundation for long-term economic development. In the last two years, the two state revolving fund programs have collectively provided more than $20 billion to support water infrastructure, which is estimated to create over 300,000 jobs. Additionally, through the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act or WIFI loan program, EPA has provided more than $9 billion to help finance more than $20 billion in water infrastructure while creating more than 49,000 jobs and saving ratepayers $4 billion. With strategic direction and partnerships, water infrastructure investments can also help address key challenges facing communities. For example, the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, managed by my office, prioritizes investments that protect public health and can be used by states to address affordability. To date, states have provided nearly $3 billion in Drinking Water State Revolving Fund additional subsidy to state-identified disadvantaged communities. EPA also supports access to safe drinking water on tribal lands through the Drinking Water Infrastructure Tribal Set-Aside Program. This track record of success underscores the potential of EPA's water infrastructure programs to deliver multiple benefits to communities across the country. EPA appreciates the attention that Congress and this committee have paid to addressing the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and in making critical drinking water infrastructure investments. As part of the American Rescue Plan, Congress acknowledged EPA's essential role in closing the health disparity gap by advancing environmental justice, including in the area of safe drinking water. EPA also appreciates Congress's assistance in appropriating more than $1 billion to support low-income water rate payers through a new program at the Department of Health and Human Services. Additionally, the legislative priorities in the Committee's Clean Future Act and other legislative pr proposals would help support investments in the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, protect our communities from PFAS and drinking water, and replace millions of lead service lines across the nation. EPA shares the committee's interest in addressing these critical challenges. 
Thank you again, Chair Tonko, Ranking Member McKinley, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much uh, for your time today and for the information that you'll exchange. It will be indeed very helpful. Um, we now will move to member questions. I will start, uh, Dr. McLean, by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, drinking water is an area where I hope we will be able to find bipartisan consensus, especially when we know the status quo is not adequately serving our constituents or our local government partners. As has been mentioned, EPA estimated that $472 billion will be needed over the next 20 years to maintain our water systems. This is a number that is hard to fathom. Dr. McLean, can you give us a sense of why the needs are so great? Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. I really appreciate um, the, the chance to come here and talk about our nation's uh, drinking water infrastructure. At, as you mentioned, and as, as we've discussed, the drinking water infrastructure in this nation is aging, and there is a critical need to modernize this aging infrastructure. Much of that infrastructure has been in place for decades, some for some for maybe even a hundred years. We also have a critical critical needs to increase resiliency of our systems for against natural disasters and and cyber attacks. So these are some of the reasons. Okay, um, I thank you for that. In President Biden's American Jobs Plan, includes one hundred and eleven billion dollars for the state revolving funds. Um, lead line replacements and other water infrastructure programs. Um, I know that sounds like a lot of money, uh, but do you believe that uh, the proposal was developed in the context of our best assessments of water system needs, including the cost to fully replace every lead service line in the country? Thank you. Thank you for the question. We we have um, been working closely with um, with states and water utilities to assess the needs and this um, $470 billion needs assessment that we've been talking about is through a survey of um, water utilities across the country. The need is the need is great. And EPA has been working closely with states to try to get funding and financing you know, money out the door to help water systems um, improve their improve their um, systems through the um, programs that we that we have in place today. Mm -hmm. And you know it, the financing on these projects is very important. So today, how are most water infrastructure projects um, financed? We use a we use a um, a number of tools. We have, of course, as we've discussed, um, the state revolving funds and the WIFI loan programs. Those programs can are are very critical in providing low interest financing for infrastructure improvements. And the state revolving fund, of course, includes programs for disadvantaged communities to provide um, no interest or um, loan forgiveness. We also use grant programs that are established by Congress to on for specific needs, such as supporting small and disadvantaged communities and and um, replacing um, lead service lines and other lead reduction activities. Thank you. So, if a local government cannot get support through perhaps a SRF loan or a, uh, a rare grant from EPA or from the USDA. The full cost then is really being borne by local budgets, municipal bonds, and uh, water ratepayers. Is that correct? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the the um, the decisions on how to finance infrastructure are a local decision, and um, it is correct that uh, that those um, those infrastructure improvements can be made through uh, a combination of. Um, different um, investment uh, in different investments and resources, including including um, using using um, using the bond market and using the programs that EPA or other federal agencies have. Right, and that four hundred and seventy-two billion dollars that's been calculated uh, includes needs from systems of all sizes, does it not? There are 
massive needs, I would imagine, for both rural systems and urban systems and uh, suburban in between. Is that correct? Yes, it includes the needs for, for very, very large systems and very small systems and systems on, on, on tribal lands um, in rural areas and, and urban areas all over the U.S. Uh, thank you, Dr. McLean. Um, I will now uh, yield to uh, recognize Mr. McKinley, subcommittee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions. Uh, Representative McKinley. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and welcome, uh, McLean, Dr. McLean, to the to the committee. Uh, could you tell us how much money is being spent annually? on water systems and uh, repairing leaks and breaks all across this country annually? Thank you for the question. I don't have a specific number for you on that, but as you, as you recognized in your statement, it is a significant issue and systems okay. do spend considerable if, amounts on- if Dr. McLean, if you could get back to me, I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Uh, if you could get back with some numbers on it. Uh, so my, my question then it also is it if the American Water Works Association has projected that it could be as much as $1.7 trillion uh, to fix our, our uh, aging infrastructure on water lines, just water lines, we're talking about sewer and sewage and, and systems, but just on water lines, how, how, long, how long do you think it would be appropriate, what, what, what time frame would be appropriate to, to make the repairs, something uh, hopefully less than a hundred years. So are we talking about twenty years, thirty years? What would be the what would be the level of improvements we have to make to, to retire in twenty or thirty years? Thank you for that question. The needs are great, and they are they exist both in our. Drinking no, I'm just trying to find out for plan a year. Get, what what would be an appropriate time frame uh, to fix all our water lines? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that are maybe 50 years old or so. Some give me some conditions by which we could say we're going to fix all our water lines uh, and leaks and breaks over a 30-year period. Is is that a fair? Is with something like that, or do you want to go 100 years? The decisions about construction projects really happen at a very local level, and the but, yeah, but, but they they're they're driven locally based on the ability to pay. Uh, and we know right. most of the most of these SCR they're they're not they're not grants. These are uh, low interest loans, and maybe they can be zero. But they they've got to find the resources to be able to do that. Uh, I've designed numbers of water systems in, in this country. Uh, I understand a lot of how the financing goes. I'm just trying to figure out what the time frame is to address that because for communities and public service districts that, that are aging or unemployed, they're going to be they're hard to press to be able to implement a higher rate. So my question then would, uh, since you don't have, you're not giving me a year on this thing, I'd like to get some, if you could, maybe you need to think about that, Dr. McLean, come back and say, we, we ought to fund something that could be done over 50 years or 30 years. I'd like to hear that. But, but secondly, could you go back when my opening statement was having to do with, could we use the funds that we have from COVID for state and local government since it's used for healthcare on this, is with that, would you agree that that's a way that we might want to approach this? Using the unappropriated money that the state and local courts have that they can spend? Did you understand what I was trying to get to? Thank you for the question. And I, and I will commit to getting back to you on the on your question of um of of projects and the and the years. Um I do could you could we use do you would you support using some of the unappropriated COVID funds that are used by some states for for roads uh, and bridges or they've made some uh, infrastructure proof? Could we use that for water lines? Because right now it's my understanding we, we're we're prohibited from using that for for uh, augmenting uh, the state revolving fund. Would you would you support that concept? Mm -hmm. Well, as director of the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water, my job is to ensure that we are as efficiently as possible using the funds that are appropriated by Congress. And we will continue to do that. And we'll be doing that in close partnership with the states and the and the local communities who have these infrastructure needs. Okay. I'm not I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get an answer on anything. So if I could just section 205 of HR 3291 
strikes the small system variances provisions in the Safe Drinking Water Act. These variances permit systems serving our nation's smallest drinking water systems can, that cannot meet the national primary drinking water regulations. Is it correct that this variance by law is not permanent and that the quality of drinking water is required to ensure adequate protection of public health? So as, as, as the director of the drinking water program, I am in I am implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act as, as it is written um, in the development of standards. Currently, the Safe Drinking Water Act has yeah. provisions for states to give variances if EPA well, has found that um, water treatment is, is not affordable. Dr. McLean, I've, I've gone over my time, but uh, you, you filibustered very well. I'm sorry, I, I hope you get back to me with the answers on the other questions, but thank you very much. Water is critical. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Representative Pallone, Chairman Pallone, full committee chair for five minutes to ask questions. Representative uh, Pallone. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. Uh, Dr. McLean, I appreciate every, everything you said in your testimony about how EPA's drinking water program can improve public health and create jobs and support economic uh, prosperity. But I, I think the Safe Drinking Water Act is primarily a public health statute, so I wanted to ask a few questions about that. How can investing in removing lead service lines improve the safety of drinking water? And what does that mean for public health? And then secondly, what about investing in treatment technology to remove PFAS from drinking water? Thank you for, thank you for that question. Um, both lead and PFAS are um, significant public health issues that um, are a top priority for, for EPA. Removing lead service lines um, can contribute to public health protections. And what we know about lead in drinking water is that it's a very serious issue. It can be devastating for children and adults to be exposed to lead in their drinking water because lead is a neurotoxin. And when there are homes that have lead service lines, removing those lead service lines um, is a significant advancement in the reduction of lead because um, those service lines can be the, um, the greatest contributor of lead in a home that has a lead service line. And what about investing in treating in treatment technology to remove uh, PFAS from drinking water? Yes, EPA um, is doing a lot of research on um, the uh, the ability of treatment, different treatment technologies to remove PFAS and removing PFAS in drinking water is it is a protection that we um, support states and local communities at, in making. And what about um, investing in school led testing and and drinking fountain replacement to help protect children? Uh, both the testing and the and the drinking fountain replacement. Thank you. Uh, children spend a significant amount of their time in schools and child care centers and um, removing sources of lead in those places and testing testing to find out whether or not there are lead exposures in schools and child care centers are, are both um, both important measures for protecting children from lead and drinking water. All right, thanks. Um, we, we know that the environmental justice communities bear a disproportionate burden of harm from pollution, but how does assistance targeted at disadvantaged communities help protect public health um, in environmental justice communities? Again, you know, going back to water systems. Thank you. Thank you for that question. The um, under the state revolving fund and under the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, states have set up disadvantaged communities programs um, and defined disadvantaged communities um, according to um, according to to their state definitions. And EPA works with states to set up those programs to ensure that the funds are going to disadvantaged communities that that need the money to make improvements um, to their systems, especially those that are under-resourced. Right. I wanted to ask, you noted in your testimony that 93% of water systems meet all health standards, but unfortunately we have no standard for dangerous contaminants, and that includes PFAS, microcystin, and also 
the one for dioxane. So that figure does not give the full picture of drinking water safety. So it, I know I'm almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask quickly, how would setting standards for these three contaminants protect public health in communities that have them in their water? Thank you. EPA is hard at work right now developing a drinking water standard for PFOA and PFOS. And um, we are we are conducting the uh, analyses at um, to support that standard, and we expect to go to the science advisory board later this year. So we're very happy with that progress. Is that for all three, the PFAS, the microcystin, and the one for docs? And I didn't hear if you mentioned all three, all three. This is this is a regulation for um, PFOA and PFOS for, for PFAS. Oh, okay. Are, so not one for microcystins and one for dioxane yet, or is that in the cards? We are we're in the process of a, um, evaluating other contaminants under the um, um, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, our monitoring program, as well as um, evaluating the signs behind those in the um, as in our upcoming contaminant contaminant candidate list. All right. Well, I think it's really important to set up those standards because. You know, then they need to be part of our drinking water effort too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the chairman yields back. So now the chair recognizes Mrs. Rogers, full committee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions. Representative Rogers, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. McLean. I appreciate you being with us today, representing the agency and answering technical feedback, but also tackling so many bills. Uh, that are on the docket today, a lot of complex subjects. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I believe in the value of promoting safe drinking water and innovation in providing it in the areas I represent, both large and small. I also believe in the importance of investing in our children's future. One of the bills we're addressing today is the Drinking Water Funding for the Future Act that, that I've introduced with uh, the, the ranking member, Mr. McKinley. And this bill extends many of the bipartisan programs that Congress authorized in the America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 that enjoyed bipartisan support. Has EPA had any problems implementing the programs authorized in the AWIA in 2018? Thank you for that question. And we... Um, we appreciate the programs that are in place and under the Safe Drinking Water Act, we've made great progress in implementing the programs um, newly established under the America Water Infrastructure Act, including the changes to the state revolving fund program, as well as the um, establishment of risk and resiliency assessments and emergency response plans for, for water systems. And, and these and the grant programs. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, have these programs been a net positive in improving drinking water quality and system compliance? Thank you. Yes, yes, they they have been. We we really appreciate having these programs in place and we are working closely with states on implementing them. Great. Uh, two months ago, um, uh, in the the American Rescue Plan that the Democrats passed, in in section two thousand and or uh, six thousand, sorry, six thousand and two, um, EPA was given fifty million dollars to issue grants, enter into contracts, conduct other activities that quote identify and address disproportionate environmental or public health harms or risk in minority or low income populations under among other sections, section fourteen forty two of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Would you let me know if your office has spent any of this money for these activities and if any of the funding remains unspent? Thank you. Yes, we really appreciate we, we appreciate the um, appropriations and we are working right now to um, to get that money out the door. Okay. The, the, the American Rescue Plan also included a temporary assistance program at HHS, like the low-income home energy assistance program to pay water utilities to defray the, the bills of persons who are low-income or lost their jobs because of the pandemic. Has your office kept up at all with that program? And if so, can you report any of its progress and any issues with implementation? 
Thank you. And we, uh, we appreciate the program as we have heard from, from many who are struggling during this time. We are working closely with the Department of Health and Human Services. Our, my staff is working with the staff who are working on that program. And um, we, we will be continuing to work with them um, as it moves forward into implementation with states and, and the local communities. So one of the bills we're discussing today would create a formal drinking water rate subsidy program at EPA. Does EPA administer any entitlement programs that either provide income assistance to persons or otherwise benefit individuals by having their bills de de uh, defrayed? Thank you. I, I can't talk for the entire EPA on that question, um, but under the Safe Drinking Water Act, we don't currently have that type of program, but we've been working closely with the Department of Health and Human Services as they have been standing up the program and, and as they are moving into the implementation of the program. Would Would you just speak to the plan to what, what, what would be involved in setting up a, a new uh, assistance program? Thank you. Um, of course, the, any, any plan established is dependent on how it is out as written into law. So um, coming out of the details a little bit, we would, we would need to make sure that we are working closely with the water sector and with the states and the local communities and, and organizations that would be um, key partners with us in establishing, establishing such a, part, a partnership and, and program. Okay, thank you. And and I think getting the needs assessment done is probably step one. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, general lady from Colorado, Representative Deguette, who also serves as chair of the subcommittee on investigations and oversight. So we welcome you, Representative Deguette, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. I want to thank our witness because we're all concerned, obviously, about safe drinking water. I was pleased, uh, Dr. McLean, to hear you say that you um, that the agency is developing the PFAS drinking water standard for submission later this year uh, because because it's been uh, stalled for some time, and of course, uh, every single one of us has these chemicals in our congressional districts, in our, our drinking water. I just want to uh, follow up one more thing with the chairman's questionings. Are you also, is the agency, is EPA also looking at um, requiring that sewage sludge be tested for PFAS chemicals? Because, of course, they end up in, in those sources as well. Thank you for that question. Um, PFAS is a, is a top priority DPA, and um, just recently, Administrator Regan established a new council, PFAS council, and I am happy to serve on that council. We're going to be working um, across the agency and with federal partners using a one EPA approach um, to address PFAS um, in drinking water as well as in as in other in other um, environmental areas, and um, we are working right now on that strategy as we are continuing with our important work that you mentioned of developing the standard. Okay. Okay. I I really appreciate that answer. However, I did not answer my which was as you as you prioritize PFAS as you look at it an agency wide approach, are you also going to be looking at sludge contamination? So we're considering all areas um, that can have PFAS contamination, including, including sludge. Right now, we are working on um, risk assessments and um, evaluating the science. I really appreciate that. And I think, and I'm glad you're prioritizing it. Turning to the issue of um, lead service lines, because in my own uh, district in Denver, Colorado, we've been Denver Water has been working really hard to replace the lead service lines. It's true in every urban area in this country, as you noted in your opening statement. And um, uh, one of the things that they have learned 
is that costs are going to be significantly higher than the EPA estimate of $4,700 per line. It's going to be more in the range of $8,000 to $10,000 per line. And so my question to you is, do you think that it might make sense for the EPA to revise its cost estimates to account for cities where replacement costs are higher than the average as cities plan their own replacement programs? And what's the EPA doing to take uh, those cities' own local cost estimates into account? Thank you for that question. Um, as with many construction projects, uh, lead service line removal does have a range of costs depending on the local conditions. And we certainly want information from communities that are um, right now in the midst of lead service line removal programs so that we can take those costs into consideration. So the answer is working with the local communities. Yes, as we as we need cost information, we are certainly reaching out to states and um, water organizations and communities to get all of the information available. Yes. I, it would seem to be, I mean, for example, Mr. McKinley's question about given, given the huge magnitude of this problem, if you don't have that kind of data, then it's pretty much impossible to estimate how long it's going to take. Uh, to replace all of these lead pipes. Wouldn't that be fair to say? Well, we do have a, a significant, uh, you know, a, we do have data on this as as you're suggesting, new data is, comes comes to the forefront every day. And so it so it is important for us to continue to to gather to gather new information on costs. Right. And that way that'll help you be able to, for example, here in Denver, um, they've embarked, Denver Water has embarked on a very aggressive lead pipe program, but it's going to take 15 years just in one city. So I think this is something that we all have to grapple with, and I'm pleased that the EPA is, is um, uh, making an effort to do that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Representative Johnson. You're recognized for five minutes, please. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, if, if our constituents were to tune in to our hearing today, they might be led to believe that this hearing is designed to address the noble goal of ensuring access to clean water, replacing old lead pipes and removing toxins from their tap water. Unfortunately, that's not what's going on here. Last week, we heard Secretary Granholm admit that the Biden administration wants to ban hydraulic fracturing on public lands. She conceded that in her appearance before our energy subcommittee. Uh, well, today we are seeing how the left will try to, to ban it from state and private lands too. Under the guise of a discussion to ensure access to clean water tucked into Title VI of the Clean Future Act are multiple proposals that if enacted could amount to a ban on hydraulic fracturing across the country. The American people need, deserve, and must have clean water. We all agree on that. And we should do everything we can to ensure that. But they also deserve affordable and reliable energy, not to mention the thousands of essential consumer products, medical devices, clothing, and other conveniences that are all made from petrochemicals. And how do we get those petrochemical raw materials? We harvest them through oil and gas production. And that takes hydraulic fracturing. And what about the jobs associated with producing these petrochemical products? My district in eastern and southeastern Ohio is home to a thriving oil and gas industry and a community that takes pride in safely providing these abundant resources. In Ohio, it's the state that takes the lead in regulating, all, regulating our oil and gas activity, in part because the EPA does not have the regional expertise or the technical capacity to effectively regulate this industry from Washington, D.C. The last thing we need is more duplicative, onerous, top-down mandates coming out of Washington from bureaucrats who've never actually worked in the industry. So, Director McLean, I'm concerned that Section 623 of the Clean Future Act could result 
in a de facto ban on hydraulic fracturing across the country, killing hundreds of good paying uh, and thousands of good paying jobs. Uh, in your view, does the Biden administration support legislation like this that would overturn decades of precedent with a federal takeover of the state regulation of hydraulic fracturing in respect uh, to protecting groundwater? Representative Johnson, before the, um, the witness answers that question, um, might I just suggest that the, the, as a reminder to my Republican colleagues and the entire subcommittee, that the subject of the hearing um, uh, is water infrastructure. Families across the country are worried about the safety of their water and their ability to pay their water bills. So I would ask if we could please keep uh, on that topic of infrastructure that is failing and lead service lines that are poisoning our kids. These bills should be our top priority and that's the focus of today's hearing. So I will not take from your time. We'll let you go a little longer, but I just want to make certain that we stay within the the, uh, the subject of today's hearing. Uh, Dr. McLean? Dr. McLean, do you, uh, do you need me to restate that question? Yes, thank you, that would be helpful. Yeah, I, I'm concerned that section 623 of the Clean Future Act could result in a de facto ban on hydraulic fracturing. And let me point out that it's been the assertion for years that hydraulic fracturing damages the water. So in that regard, Mr. Chairman, this is a relevant question. Uh, and it would kill hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs. So in your view, Dr. McLean, does the Biden administration support legislation like section 623 uh, that would overturn decades of precedent with the federal takeover of state regulations of hydraulic fracturing as it regards uh, protecting groundwater? Thank you. I think um, I will be happy to take your question back and to provide you technical assistance on this. As the in the drinking water office, we are working to um, to implement the provisions under the Safe Drinking Water Act that are associated with underground um, underground injection control programs. Okay, um, I, I tell you what, I, uh, because the chairman uh, kind of cut my time short. Let me move on to my other question, and if you could, if you could please uh, uh, take that question and get back to us, I'd appreciate that. Um, one, one final question. In your expertise in the field of groundwater and drinking water, do you believe there is evidence of widespread systemic contamination as a result of hydraulic fracturing? I mean, even Gina McCarthy, President Biden's chief advisor on domestic climate change, has previously said there is not. I mean, have you seen that American communities are capable of having both safe drinking water and economic development around oil and gas production? Thank you. We we do want to ensure that all, all Americans have access to safe drinking water. I don't have the details on the studies that you're that you're referring to right now, but I'm happy but to could you take, take that back. Could, you take, uh, could uh, Dr. McLean, I'm going to I'm going to yield back my time uh, since we've run out. But could you take that question back and talk to your political leadership as well? Uh, because these are important questions. I'd be happy to take that back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Representative Johnson, we let you have additional time because of uh, my request that we stay on the topic of today's hearing. I will echo that sentiment again so that uh, we can really focus on water infrastructure and um, the uh, assistance we can provide our partners in local government. With that, we'll recognize Representative Schakowsky of Illinois, who also serves as chair of the Subcommittee on uh, Consumer Prote Commerce and Consumer Protection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, uh, the EPA estimates that there are roughly 6.3 to 9.3 million lead service lines remaining in the United States. Um, the number may be as high as 400,000 in Chicago alone. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Chicago. I'm very, I'm very worried and we're in, a, I think, kind of a unique situation of not having done much. Um, the vice president, 
um, uh, Vice President Harris came to Chicago a while ago um, and was looking at some COVID things, but she saw, when, when I saw her, she mentioned to me that Illinois has about 25% of all of the lead pipes, lead service lines um, in, the, in the country. Um, and the Chicago Tribune did uh, a, a study um, a, a, of this and, and, and what they found, let me just quote a, a bit from that, um, that uh, Chicago lacks far behind other cities um, and is ground zero for the, the problem, talking about lead. And, and said that, um, uh, let's see, um, that um, dozens of citizens already have a, ha, do, dozens of cities rather already have a head start in eliminating the, ling, the uh, lingering threat to public health. One glaring omission is Chicago. And I'm, I absolutely, I live very close to the city border, but I, I live in Evanston, Illinois. I live in a very old house. And I was just looking up, and maybe this is kind of a technical question, but I wonder if you can answer it. It said most water service, uh, service lines in Evanston are older and, um, and uh, const uh, constructed with lead. Um, lead pipes, blend, um, blend, uh, what's it called? Uh, something about blended phosphate um, is added to the water during the treatment process. Um, and this chemical creates a coating inside. If I live in a place where um, this is put as a, as a coating, are we out of the woods here? Do we need to replace this? My house was built in 1911. We have houses built in the 1800s. And I'm just wondering, um, are, are we really okay because something's put in the water? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Addressing lead and drinking water is, is a top priority at EPA. And we do know that there is a correlation with older older homes and the potential of having a lead service line, especially in areas like the Midwest where there was a high prevalence of use of lead service lines. Um, we, um, we do, we do um, know that also that corrosion control, which is the treatment that you referred to, um, can be an, an important treatment for utilities to use to reduce the corrosivity of the water because that's how lead gets into drinking water. If water is corrosive and it flows over a lead source, then um, lead can leach into the drinking water. When you have a lead service line, that lead service line can be a very significant contributor to whatever lead might be coming out of the tap in that home. And and that's why the removal of a lead service line, the permanent removal of that source of lead is an important mitigation step against lead in drinking water. Whether the system is using corrosion control, which is an important treatment or, or not. So in uh, 2016, I visited Flint. Um, Nancy Pelot, the speaker, um, had a, a trip that we, we went to and for me in Chicago now, what most people may not know is that in Illinois, between 2015 and 2020, um, there were many homes whose um, exposure to lead was just as high as it was in Flint. Can you talk a little bit more about what the dangers are of, uh, I guess, just a few more seconds, but uh, of, uh, of lead? Thank you. Yes, lead is, lead is a neurotoxin and it is dangerous to children from a brain development perspective and it's dangerous to all people, children and adults, in terms of the potential damage to other organs like kidneys and, and, and the heart. Well, you know, we have to we have to get on this. and I'm just interested in what Mr. Uh, McKinley's uh, question was about how long will this take? We got to get on it and in my state especially. So thank you very much. Maybe Thank we can you. get together with uh, some of the Illinois folks. Thanks. Thank you. I'd be happy to do that. I yield back. Okay, the um, gentle lady yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Curtis from the state of Utah. What, we didn't have 
Representative Carter on the screen. Is he he was scheduled next? If he's not available, we'll move to Representative Curtis. Representative Curtis, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm one of those that has left the warm bed to visit a resident's home that have been flooded by broken uh, water mains. And um, as I've listened to this hearing, I find myself reflecting on the many burdens of local government. We've heard today of the massive needs for water infrastructure, but cities also have aging sewer systems and roads. And in my city, the city I live in, they face a bill of tens of millions of dollars uh, just to meet the new discharge standards for their sewer system. And it's not hard to make a case that uh, water infrastructure is in desperate need of attention. It's not hard to make a case that it's that there should be some federal involvement. But I'd like to point out very gently that the wrong kind of involvement from the federal government is not always good or welcome. And a couple of quick examples of that uh, are frequently uh, uh, over regulation, excessive regulations when a federal dollars are used can increase the cost of an infrastructure project as much as 30%. And uh, something that, that hasn't been brought up today, but is worth thinking about, and that is the um, when if we subsidize um, those who are uh, having trouble making uh, their water payments, we can sometimes frustrate a city's efforts to um, get people to conserve. A lot of times, water rates are actually based upon uh, an incentive to, to conserve. And I know that our current uh, systems allow quite a bit of flexibility to states and cities in those incentives. But it's just a couple of good examples of how the wrong time of, of involvement can be a problem. And Dr. McLean, um, I'd love to know, and first of all, kind of hold this question while I ask you a couple more questions, if that's okay. But what do local governments really want from us, in, right, in, in this massive uh, uh, problem that they face? And um, Right now, as, as a mayor, we would use municipal uh, tax-free municipal bonds as a great tool, right? And and let's face it, there's a there's an impact to the treasury when we use those because the revenue is not received um, on, on the interest. But there's also a cost to the treasury with a lot of the programs that we're putting forward. Which ones are really most helpful to to municipalities? And um, do we have to worry about federalizing? Uh, the funding of water systems in, in, in a way that cities now become dependent on us and um, are, are subject to our mandates and requirements. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. For those questions. Um, as, as, you, um, as you note, um, these decisions are really are really local, and we want to meet communities where they are in partnership with states to help them figure out um, through technical assistance um, what they need best, what what financing and funding programs, what combination of those will work best for that local community to address the problems of of aging infrastructure. Technical assistance is a really big part of this because especially small communities um, do um, do need sometimes need some help in increasing the capacity of the system to to financially and managerial manage the system and and we have programs established in the state under the State Drinking Water Act to help to help systems with that. You know, a lot of municipalities. Um, want Water is a bargain, right? And um, and frequently, and I know some municipalities don't even charge for water because they don't meter it. And yet, um, there's intense pressure not to raise rates uh, from taxpayers in, in a city. From from your experience, right? How do we balance this this need uh, to have low water rates, but also have um, the cost of water be the true cost of water, particularly if we're talking about upgrading systems? Thank you. Affordability of water is is a real challenge, and it is a challenge that um, needs needs really solutions from the local, state, and federal level working together. Um, while we're not as involved at the federal level at, on rate structure, we do have assistance programs to help systems understand. Um, 
best practices and tools to establish rate structures to um, run the system and maintain it. Doctor, I'm going to run out of time. I certainly don't mean to cut you off, but I I was referring to more of the problem that municipalities are really not charging the full freight in in many cases, and that we've we've, we've got to make sure that we're um, in the best taxes and and fees are those most associated with the use. And I was was just trying to make that point. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time and we'll yield. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from... uh, Maryland. Representative Sarbanes, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate you holding the hearing. I want to thank you for your leadership on these issues. And I want to focus my questions on the drinking water standards in particular. Uh, Congress amended the Safe Drinking Water Act, SIDWA, in 1996 uh, to make the statute, quote, more effective after citing challenges in regulating drinking water contaminants. However, as we know, the changes made in 1996 did not actually lead to more health-based protections for communities as EPA has struggled to set drinking water standards um, for over 20 years. Under the 1996 amendments, EPA is required every five years to make a regulatory determination uh, for at least five contaminants on the contaminant candidate list. Uh, Dr. McLean, and, and thank you for appearing today. We very much appreciate it. How many unregulated drinking water contaminants has EPA proposed to regulate since the implementation of the 1996 amendments and how many of those have been finalized? Thank you for that for, the, for that question. EPA has, has um, water standards for more than 90 contaminants. And we have um, put in place many regulations since the 1996 amendments, and these include regulations to reduce risk from disinfection byproducts, from arsenic, from pathogens like viruses and groundwater and cryptosporidium and surface waters and lead and plumbing and fixtures. Uh, Just recently, we issued a regulatory determination to to propose regulations for PFO and PFOS, and and we are hard at work on on that regulation right now. How many many of these have been finalized since 1996? We've had many regulations finalized since 1996, including some of those that I mentioned earlier on the disinfection byproducts and the, um, the groundwater um, regulations and um, lead and plumbing fixtures. Um, I don't have a number right now, but I could be happy to take that back and and get it to you. As the and but the PFAS and PFO those have not been finalized as yet. Right, we are we are working on the proposed regulation right now. We have just issued the um, regulatory determination in March of this year. Let me raise something that concerns me um, in terms of how the standards ultimately get set. Um, I gather that when you're promulgating one of these drinking water regulations, you set a a non-enforceable maximum contaminant level goal. So this is the goal that you see based on on the analysis. That's based on health data. Um, In addition, you then set an enforceable maximum contaminant level in MCL, which is set as close to the goal as feasible. So we get into this feasible concept um, what does feasible mean in this uh, context, uh, Dr. McLean? How is the cost considered as part of that judgment? Thank you for the question. As, as you say, we do consider a range of science, um, health-based science, as we're developing the maximum contaminant level goal. And when we're looking at setting that um, standard, that maximum contaminant level as close as feasible um, to the maximum contaminant level goal, we are looking at also doing significant analysis on available treatment technologies, as well as the cost of those technologies and the ability of those treatments to, um, to address the contaminant. For example, for PFOA and PFOS, we'll be we're working closely with our Office of Research and Development on new research that they're doing to understand how much of different specific PFAS are removed by different treatments, as well as what the cost of running and using those operating those technologies are. 
So the the clearly what happens is that the the um, the actual contaminant level standard that gets set because of the feasibility analysis that ends up typically being weaker than the goal. But I also understand that there's a further analysis, a health risk reduction and cost analysis that is conducted. This is another level. Um, and that can lead to standards that are even less stringent than the feasibility standards are. So that's very concerning. And I know one of the things that we're considering um, is whether that needs to be changed, that extra level of analysis, which is really, in a sense, um, two bites at the apple on this feasibility approach needs to be removed so that we can stay closer to the health dimensions um, of the goal. And would you agree that without the section I just re um, referenced in SIDWA that the standards would be um, at least as protective as the feasibility standard would be? Is that correct? We are, we're right now, it, we are in, in implementing the um, Safe Drinking Water Act standard setting process as it's established, and we're happy to work with your office to provide technical assistance on legislative changes that you might be considering. Thanks very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The, the gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama. Um, Representative Palmer, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to talk to uh, Ms. McLean about some of the requirements the EPA imposes. Uh, we understand that communities have finite resources and that not all the communities have the same needs. What I want to know is, is why we're getting rid of the cost benefit requirement in HR 3291. You're imposing a one-size-fits-all instead of allowing a cost-benefit analysis. Why would that be removed? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Well, you're, you're using up my time but not responding. Well, we are we are busy developing regulations under the Safe Drinking Water Act as it is added, as it is written. Um, we are happy to provide technical assistance on, on legislative changes. Yeah, I'm consider. asking you why you have a one size fits all. I mean, you uh, prioritize regulatory stringency over public health and you encourage unfunded and, un, uh, and underfunded mandates that force state and local governments to divert funds away from other critical needs. And I'm giving an example of this. Uh, the Clinton EPA in 1993 issued a drinking water standard for epizine that required treatment to below three parts per billion. Okay, a human would, under those standards, a human would have to drink over 3,000 gallons of water per day for three parts per billion of epizine to equal the dose that the EPA determined would cause cancer and, and mice. Um, I, I think. When you take that into account, the cost, and, and, and there are other EPA regulations imposed on, on local communities, that they admitted the technology didn't exist to achieve those standards. So when, when you issue these regulations, why, aren't you, why aren't, are you doing away with the cost-benefit analysis? Thank you. We, we are developing our regulations under the Safe Drinking Water Act as it, as it, as it is written right now. And we are using um, the, um, the analysis that we're doing of health effects, of new science, and of treatment technologies, and developing cost and benefit analyses um, as to inform the decisions that we are making for the regulations that we're putting into place and for evaluating um, the regulations that are in place. Do you understand that there's trade-offs here? Um, the cost of compliance with that standard on atrazine uh, would have been enough to hire 2,300 teachers, okay? I don't think people would be drinking the equivalent of 71 bathtubs full of water every day for 70 years 
to be at risk of getting cancer from atrazine. Uh, I, I don't think the benefit of preventing that would outweigh the benefit of, of being able to provide funding for other things like hiring a teacher or um, maybe investing in broadband, particularly in rural communities. Do you understand the, the situation that I have a number of small towns in my district. Do you understand the situation in the, uh, that you put them in, in in the context of the trade-offs uh, the cost benefit uh, issues that, that these smaller communities face, and even some of the larger communities, when you have, when you take away that, that cost benefit analysis requirement. Thank you. We, we, we do understand the challenges that are faced by communities that have, they have a lot on their plate and small communities included. We, um, we have technical assistance programs to help systems implement the regulations, and we, and we also help them understand what funding is available um, as, they are, as they work to try to come into compliance with the regulations. I think you need to keep the cost-benefit analysis uh, provision in the legislation. I think we need to focus on some of the issues. I mean, the EPA was... Uh, Part of the cover-up of, of the lead issue in Flint, Michigan, we need to address those issues. Uh, but I really believe that we need this cost-benefit. I think it goes back to what uh, Congressman Johnson was talking about in regard to eliminating fracking, uh, uh, the economic disaster that that creates for us on the energy side of things. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the... Uh Gentle lady from New York, Representative Clark, former, uh, recent former vice chair of the full committee. So you have five minutes to ask questions, uh, Representative Clark. I thank you, Chairman Tank Tonko and uh, Ranking Member McKinley for convening this hearing on the pressing need to ensure that our drinking water is clean and safe. And I'd like to also thank our witness, Dr. McClain, for your testimony today. Lead contamination in drinking water continues to pose a major health risk across the nation, especially to young children. Simply put, there's no safe level for lead when it comes to children. Lead exposure can cause irreversible damage to the child's development, and it is critical that we make every effort to remove lead toxins from drinking water in schools and childcare facilities. The League of Conservation Voters recently released a report in New York State entitled Five is the New 15, which highlights the need to protect our children by significantly lowering the acceptable threshold for lead in school drinking water. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit this report for the record. Representative Clark, we will uh, acknowledge all requests for documents at the end of the hearing, but uh, Please continue. Thank you, sir. I thank you. So Dr. McLean, I'd like to better understand the steps EPA is taking to address this pressing issue. What methods does the Environmental Protection Agency use to protect children from exposure to lead in their drinking water, particularly in schools? And how might these measures change with the updated lead and copper rule? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Lead is a very serious issue and it's a top priority at EPA. And um, lead in school drinking water um, is important from the perspective of the, the fact that kids spend a lot of their time at kid, uh, schools and child care centers. And we approach this issue from um, using all the tools we have available to us. We have a voluntary program called the, the Three T's program that establishes best practices for, for testing and for um, remediation for risk communication to parents. And so we work with states and communities to understand how to use that program um, to understand the lead levels and to remediate those levels in their schools and child care centers. And we also have are implementing the funding programs that Congress established for both the school testing programs, which has been established um, in all states across the country, as well as the lead reduction program, um, which provides grants to remediate lead in school drinking water. And as you mentioned, we are also examining 
the lead and copper rule revisions, which were um, issued earlier this year, we're in the process of engaging with stakeholders to gather their input on the rule, um, including considerations for schools lead drinking water. Thank you. Has the EPA considered or is the agency currently considering the possibility of separate, more stringent action level under the lead and copper rule for schools, such as the five parts per billion threshold that New York and other states are looking into? Yeah, thank you. As I, as I mentioned, we are in the process right now of engaging with stakeholders and, and, um, and getting input on the rule. We had listening sessions over the past month and we're, we're just about to start community roundtables and we expect those roundtable discussions to include discussions of school drinking water. Um, we'll be having roundtables with 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 um, with other water sector stakeholders and states also, and um, we'll be taking all of this this consideration um, into into the agency for our decision making um, as we move through these engagements. And thanks to the recent work of our committee, federal funding is now available to help schools and childcare facilities not only test voluntarily for lead in their drinking water, but also to cover the cost of replacing older, older drinking water fountains. The Assistance Quality and Affordability Act of 2021, one of the bills under consideration today, would extend the authorization timeframes of these critical programs for another 10 years. How would extending these programs through 2031 better enable the EPA to keep children safe from lead in their drinking water? Thank you. We appreciate the work that you've done to put these programs into place. And um, the need is great in schools um, in reducing lead in their drinking water. So having these programs available um, is, is very helpful to, to reaching our goal of reducing that lead exposure in schools. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My time has run out and I yield back. The general lady yields back. And now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Representative Carter. Recognize for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And thank you, Ms. McClain, for being here. I, I, I've just got a, a couple of quick questions here. If we are indeed able to get these capitalization grants for drinking water, state revolving loan funds to, to rise and to increase, it makes sense that the states are going to have to increase their activities as well. And we want to make sure that they can accommodate the requirements under the program. Based on what you're hearing from the state drinking water officials, will it be difficult for states to meet their statutory match requirements? Thank you for the question. We we appreciate uh, our partnership with the states in um, in enacting the state um, revolving fund programs um, as they're as they're described under in statute. Um, ultimately, the the states are going to make these um, important community uh, considerations um, depending on you know the, the the need in their communities, and we'll we we will be there to support them in those decision making processes. How long do you think it's going to take them to ramp up? Are they going to have adequate time to ramp up for this? One of EPA and the states both have experience with these programs, and we um, we intend to build on the successful track record that we have both in the federal federal government and in the and in the state governments um, in in using these programs and getting money out to support the. Um, the infrastructure needs across the country. Well, what would happen to a state program that can't, met, can't meet the match? Uh, would they lose the funding or, or, or have an unfunded, underfunded mandate to implement? Thank you for the question. Um, we we do work closely with states to try to find um, ways to help them meet the match. We've done this and this a number of times. If a state can't meet the match, they can apply for a, a lower level. And um, but we but we really do um, work hard to help them meet that meet the match and to find resources um, to do that. 
can you get, I, I know it's not a, a fair question, but at the same time, can you give me an idea? How the state's doing? Have they been growing their individual funds? I mean, they're partners in this, and I want to make sure that they are doing their part as well. Thank you. Yes, these are these are successful programs. The funds have grown over the years since the SRF have been established, and it has been a, a successful way to have fun, financing and funding available for our nation's drinking water infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield you back two minutes. Thank you. Well, we appreciate the two minutes, and uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, representative from the state of California, Dr. Ruiz. You're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and for considering my bill, the Emergency Oasis Act. Uh, over the past year, I have spoken in this committee many times about the environmental injustices taking place in my district uh, at the Oasis Mobile Home Park and other areas in some of our underserved communities. And I'll continue to advocate for them until I know my constituents can safely turn on their faucets without being exposed to toxins. Since August 2019, Oasis Mobile Park has been under an EPA emergency order under Section 1431 of the Safe Drinking Water Act due to arsenic contamination nine times the legal limit. In the weeks following the revelation that they were drinking arsenic-laden water, the residents of Oasis faced a nightmare scenario due to predatory park ownership who, one, failed to quickly provide replacement drinking water, two, then put residents' uh, restrictions on who could access that water, then raised rent by over 30%, and then threatened evictions. And while the EPA Region 9 staff have been diligent and attentive to the situation, it was during this crisis that we saw the limits of EPA's enforcement abilities. The Safe Drinking Water Act threatens fines of $15,000 per day for violations of an emergency order, but the process takes time and it's cumbersome. When residents require replacing drinking water, now they can't wait weeks or longer for a legal process to play out in the courts. So, Dr. McLean, under Section 1431, what are EPA's current enforcement abilities if a water system owner or operator fails to provide replacement drinking water pursuant to an EPA order? Thank you. Thank you for that question. We um, we work closely with our partners in our Office of Enforcement and Compliance, as well as in as in the regional offices, as in Region Nine in this case. And um, we do see that we have a number of tools available to us in 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 the in the statute, and we work hard to to implement the statute as it as it is written. And I think that the thing that it that we are very appreciative of um, the, your attention to this issue and this um, this you know the, these folks were drink had had contaminated water and we want to make sure that we we address that and, in so, a and so how long how long does that process take you say you have different tools there's been no true enforcement no fines and it's almost two years that they're struggling with this for how, how long does that process take from initial reports of non-compliance and violations to the day fine is levied? Well, I can't speak directly for the enforcement program because it's, outs it's outside of my office. Um, I'd be happy to take that question back and, and talk to my colleagues. Thank you. So my bill, the em Emergency Oasis Act, would give EPA the authority to step in and provide drinking water in cases where an owner of a system fails to do so within a week of an order going into effect. EPA would then recoup the cost of the water plus a penalty from the system owner who would be prohibited from passing those costs on to the residents. Dr. McLean, under the provision that I just described, would residents who are not provided alternative drinking water by a system owner likely get access to safe drinking water faster than under the current process? Thank you for the question. I'm, I'm not prepared to talk at that, at that level of detail on, on the provisions. And well, I think if an owner if an owner doesn't provide water for 14 days and the EPA is able to provide water in seven days, then then I think the match just speaks for itself that they I think they would be able to get water faster if they were able to get it sooner by the EPA. 
Uh, and then also the, the second piece of the Emergency Oasis Act focuses on making sure the entire drinking water system is safe before it is put back into service. At the Oasis Mobile Home Park, the initial EPA emergency order was focused on the well filtration system, yet it took a community group, an outside group, to test the distribution system where they found that arsenic remained in the water pipes as well, despite the EPA order saying it was okay to drink that water. Section 1431 of the Safe Drinking Water Act gives the EPA broad authority to implement remedies to fix an unsafe system. Dr. McLean, a situation like o Oasis or other, uh, other places where the contamination point is a well, does EPA have the ability to ensure that a contaminant hasn't built up in the distribution system? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I'd be happy to talk to my colleagues um, who are implementing the enforcement provisions um, of, of our statute. Um, we do have many tools available to us. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to working with you, the EPA, your colleagues in the enforcement tools, and those that know how to clear a system from contaminants, uh, because this is a, a problem identified in my district that is systemic uh, and, and could be eliminated with this provision uh, in my bill. So I appreciate it, and I yield back my time. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Representative Crenshaw. You're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. Look, I think the clean drinking water and making sure that uh, lead is not infused with that drinking water is uh, certainly something we can agree on. As usual, though, we uh, find ourselves scratching our heads at the proposals um, in order to fix a, a specific problem. You know, we look at the price tag on this $45 billion, and um, I, I have to wonder why we not start out with a smaller amount and make sure that the policy being put in place is actually going to work. And I have a lot of doubts that it will. I mean, what we're talking about is the vast majority in private homes, um, where older private homes, where lead pipes might still exist, and it's difficult to get to this stuff. And I'm not so sure that the incentives being created here will work. I don't think there's a lot of guardrails in place. So, so the first um, question for Ms. McLean is, how do we know where all the lead lines are in America? How do we know which ones to replace? Thank you for the question. We, we do have estimates on the numbers of lead service lines in the country, six to 10 million service, uh, lead service lines across the country. And that information is really held at a local level. Um, so different communities have different levels of understanding of the lead service lines that they might have um, in their system. And- um, it, sound, it sounds like we don't know. And I mean, that's a, that's a short answer. I know EPA does have an assessment coming out, but this bill doesn't even require that this money be spent on what EPA identifies, does it? Thank you for the question. The the the, the water systems that um, the water systems have the information have information on lead service lines in their uh, in their systems, and EPA works to provide guidance to systems. No, no, that, that, would be, that, would be news, that would be news to a lot of local authorities who we've been speaking to about this bill. It's extremely difficult to know where these lead pipes are. You have to now. What would happen? I'm assuming is that this money would be used to pay engineering companies vast amounts of money to go survey neighborhoods and see where the see where the lead is. I, I would assume that would be the case. But here's here's a problem. We're talking about guardrails. Is there anything in this in this bill that would stop limitless and endless surveys and wasting all that money? There are a number of there are a number of systems that have unknown service lines, and there are um, there is guidance that the EPA can provide that states can provide to help those systems find those lead service lines and understand where they're most likely and and to, my question. to live with them. That wasn't my question at all. But the question is, how do you stop endless surveys and wasting the, this money? The, the the other thing about this bill is, you know. How do we prioritize? Um, are, are any Americans being left out of this? How do we prioritize where we look and how lead service line replacement um, actually gets sought out? How does this bill do that? We're happy to provide technical assistance to your office on the specific details of the legislation being considered. Why don't you do it right now? 
Do you not know what's in the legislation? Do you not know what how this bill prioritizes it? I this agree. Is on this, this is a hearing on this specific bill and this specific, this is specific provision in the bill. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have come prepared to talk about the provisions in the bill, but when you, but not at the a very, very specific level of detail yeah. um, in consideration. Well, I do know the answer to the questions I'm asking. I'm surprised you don't. And, and the reality is, is that there's nothing in this bill that prioritizes communities with the highest lead readings or homes in the oldest housing stocks, which would obviously make the most sense if we're trying to use the money correctly. Again, we're just talking about guardrails right here. And please come better prepared to speak about, about these. The other issue is I see in this is flexibility. So is there anything in this bill that would allow some flexibility? For instance, you have old homes that aren't going to be around much longer. This is the most likely place where you might have lead in the home. There's other ways, scientifically proven ways, much cheaper ways, say putting an epoxy coating on those pipes to fix the problem without doing a $20,000 remodeling of the home. Does this bill allow for that kind of flexibility? Not prepared or what? What's the problem? My understanding of the bill is that, is that it is that it is a lead service line removal program and lead service lines are important to remove because they can be a significant source of lead to the people living in the home that is served by a lead service line. All right. I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yeah. yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Representative Peters. You're recognized for five minutes, please. Hey, Dr. McLean, uh, this former um, EPA employee very much appreciates the work you do. I understand you probably don't know the details of every bit of proposed legislation. And I appreciate you being here today to tell us uh, your perspectives in general uh, from the, your position um, with respect to drinking water. Uh, and I thank you for that. And, and I know you'll get back to the committee if they have additional questions. I have some questions about resiliency. Um, in California, we're facing several simultaneous threats. Droughts are getting more severe, snow path uh, levels are decreasing, temperatures are rising, wildfires are getting more intense. We're on the front lines of the climate crisis, and for many people in California and many Americans, climate stress is often felt as water stress. Uh, according to the 2020 UN Water Development Report, climate change will lead to further water stress in regions across the globe, negatively affect water quality, and threaten safely managed water and sanitation infrastructure. My question is for you are what steps is, is the agency taking to predict general water availability in the future, considering increasingly severe drought from climate change? Thank you for the question. We, we work closely with other federal agencies um, on, um, on data on climate driven impacts to our water. And as you, as you mentioned, there, there can be significant uh, impacts both on the quality and on the quantity of the water that we know we're experiencing. And we-, right. we work So you work with other agencies, but how are, you, how are we going to ensure um, working with EPA that our water infrastructure is resilient to climate impacts? impacts? Specifically, is, is EPA or is someone devoting resources to modeling to ensure our water is, as, is safe as climate impacts increase? Yes, we are working very hard to understand the climate impacts um, that are face that our um, water utilities face, and we uh, have an, a lot of guidance in addressing um, drought as well as floods. This, because the resiliency, there's also issues with too much water, too little water. Right. There are a number of resiliency. If, if I wanted to find, if I wanted to talk to the person in the federal government who is in charge of the modeling. To understand uh, what changes we're going to face as a nation, also geographically, who would I talk to? Is that in your department or is that someone else? Is that in another department you're working with? Yes, that's in it. That is in it. Other parts of the EPA, as well as with, as well as in other agencies in the federal government, it's a collaborative effort, and we'd be happy to get back to you with more more specific information on the modeling that you're looking for. I would like to understand that. You know, my concern is that if everyone's doing it, no one's doing it. And um, so I would I, I would expect you to know that today, but I would like to know who's responsible for modeling that so that 
the federal government is making sure that um, uh, we're providing localities with this information, but also that we're aware as a nation of what's going on. So I appreciate you getting back to me on that. Uh, in San Diego, we have a serious water supply issue. Um, and one promising solution is to significantly increase the amount of recycled water, including black water. San Diego is uh, currently implementing the Pure Water Program, which aims to use proven water recycling and reuse technology. We're gonna produce 83 million gallons of purified drinking water per day, rather than discharging usable fresh water into the ocean. My question for you is, how could EPA provide incentives or do these incentives exist to other coastal and riverine communities to invest in uh, um, aggressive water recycling, including black water recycling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, water reuse is an important tool that's available to utilities and EPA um, provides information to utilities and works with states to help utilities um, assess some of these technologies. And we um, and we have fun financing tools, as, as you are aware of, that are available to help support the investment in those um, technologies if systems choose to implement them. Can you briefly describe for me what those financing tools are that exist today and whether we need more, if you have an opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Um, our existing tools right now that are the um, the state revolving funds. We have a clean water and a drinking water state revolving fund, which both come into play here with the reuse technologies that you're talking about, as well as the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act um, loan program, which is um, which is an important resource for low interest financing. And um, we have a number of. Um, grant programs available at, from the EPA. But we have just let me, I, I'm, running out of, I'm running out of time, uh, Dr. McLean, but do you think we're sufficiently resourced to support the needs around the country or, or do, we need, do we need more resources? The, the infrastructure needs across the country are, are great. For drinking water alone, we estimate over $470 billion need. Okay, well, I appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Representative Baragan. You are recognized for five minutes, please. Well, thank you, Chair Tonko, for holding this important hearing on the Clean Future Act and drinking water legislation that can help ensure every community in America has clean and affordable drinking water. Dr. McLean, thank you for being here with us today. In 2018, the sativa water system in my district in Compton, California, had issues with brown water, affordability, debt, and outdated infrastructure. It had to be taken over by the county. This is an issue for many small urban and rural water systems in California and throughout the country that can struggle with meeting both affordability and water quality standards. Can you talk about how the EPA works with water systems over issues of consolidation and if there's any federal policy guidance or funding to help facilitate these when necessary? Thank you for the question, yes. Um, as, as you are, um, as you say, there are many, many systems that struggle with, um, with providing um, safe drinking water and EPA is there with technical assistance programs so that systems can have the, the capacity from a technical and managerial and financial standpoint to operate those systems. Sometimes one of the options that is that is a is the right decision for that locality is to consolidate with another system and we have a um, a program at, at EPA, our partnership program that provides resources to local um, communities that are that want to use that option for um, addressing their their difficulties at their system, and we work with the states very closely in this. Thank you. A recent report from the Natural Resources Defense Council showed that 186 million Americans drank water from systems with lead levels exceeding the level of one part per billion, which is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics to protect children from lead in school water. For over 61 million Americans, this level exceeds five parts per million. The city of Los Angeles was one of the most affected systems. 
How important is the proposed America's, Americans Jobs Plan uh, proposed $45 billion investment for replacing all lead service pipes throughout the country to reducing lead in the water? Thank you for the question. Lead is a neurotoxin and it is very, um, very dangerous to be exposed to lead in drinking water for children and, and for adults. We know that when the lead service lines are in a home, those lead service lines are the most significant, can be the most significant source of lead to um, the home. And so removing lead service lines is a way to permanently remove that source of lead um, that can be a potential risk to the people in, in the homes. Thank you. And I, my last question builds upon what uh, Representative Peters just asked you. As the climate gets warmer and we see more extreme weather events, this will impact our water supplier, uh, supplies and availability. Nearly three quarters of California is in extreme drought. It is critical that water utilities are planning for what changes they will face now rather than reacting after they happen. Does the EPA provide any technical or financial support for water utilities to create climate adaptation plans so they can be prepared to meet the needs of their customers? Thank you, yes, we do. We provide, um, we have a climate, um, climate water uh, program for utilities to understand plan, assess their systems, plan what they need to do and to help them implement those plans. We have financial programs in place so that they can put the money where they need it to um, increase the resiliency of their system against climate driven changes. Well, thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. McLean, uh, for your leadership. I'm looking forward to working with you to make sure we're cleaning up uh, our drinking water because regardless of your zip code, Every child deserves clean drinking water. Um, every American deserves clean drinking water. And we know that water is life. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, Representative McKeachin, you are recognized for five minutes, please. And thank you for uh, your work on the environment. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as been said many times already today, everyone needs and deserves ready access to safe drinking water. But in many areas, that right is under threat, with Americans facing uncertainty about how they will meet one of life's most basic requirements. Most of Virginia's public water systems are 70 years old, and the EPA says we need to invest $8.1 billion over the next 20 years to maintain health and safety standards. As ASCE writes, excuse me, inaction could result in degraded water service water quality violations, health issues, and higher costs in the future. Legacy infrastructure laden with lead most likely found in, is most likely found in low-income communities, communities with older stock, and communities of color. Can, and these, uh, these uh, uh, infrastructure issues can leach toxins into drinking water. With an action in this area, uh, we will have long-term health impacts, particularly for our children. As we continue to see the impacts of climate change, these investments in water infrastructure will prove crucial for saltwater intrusion threatening our nation's aquifers and those who rely on them for clean water. We will need to invest in the necessary infrastructure and services to ensure clean water access for those impacted. Ms. McLean. Thank you so very much for being here today. I'm sorry, Dr. McLean. Thank you so very much for being here today. With the Justice 40 initiative taking effect in July, how does the EPA uh, plan to work with communities to ensure that their needs are being addressed and the funds are reaching communities with the greatest needs? Thank you for the question. Reliable access to safe water is so important from a health and an, and an economic standpoint, as, as, as you say. And we are working very hard to make sure that we, the programs that we have 
um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act are, are working to provide the funds where they're needed in underserved communities through those disadvantaged communities programs in the, in the state revolving fund, as well as in the grant programs that Congress has provided for small and disadvantaged communities. These are um, a really important um, source of, of, of money for communities that have um, some of these great infrastructure needs. You know, um, Dr. McLean, many of the communities where water infrastructure projects are required suffer from underemployment. Will the EPA be in a position to work to ensure that infrastructure projects benefit low-income workers and workers of color? Thank you for the question. The con construction to provide um, modernization of infrastructure and new treatment um, those those projects um, bring bring jobs, and it's an important aspect of the programs um, and for and for the local economies. Um, Dr. McLean, I don't know that this has been asked before, um, but in a general sense, well, let me describe the problem very quickly. As I already said, Virginia's got old, 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 old infrastructure, and throughout my district. In many cases, folks don't know where the uh, the uh, lines are, the water lines are until they break. Uh, that's because they were kept in the courthouse. The courthouse burned down oh, way back when, and uh, nobody's got copies of the records. Um, how can EPA help that type of locality um, locate the lines so that they can be in a position to uh, repair and replace them? Thank you for the question. Yes, there are, there are systems that know they have lead service lines, but don't have um, a lot of information on where they are, and they have um, what we call those unknown lead ser unknown uh, sorry unknown service lines. And we do provide guidance, and we are continuing to provide guidance to the states and to systems on ways to um, examine the um, service line, both from the both from the um, utility perspective and and for, and for homeowners, we have um, videos and and documents available to to help the systems. And then, real quickly, um, does that guidance have any money associated with it at this point, or do we need to provide it? Thank you for the question. We do have technical assistance programs um, where this where this could fit in, where the where a system could receive technical assistance in in this in this type of work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. I owe you twelve seconds. You do not. But anyhow, it is great to have heard from you. And uh, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentle lady from Delaware, Representative Blunt Rochester. Um, you have five minutes to ask questions, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and ranking member for calling this hearing. And thank you, Dr. McLean, for your testimony. As was said, every person in this country, regardless of race, income, or zip code, deserves the right to clean, reliable, and safe drinking water and sanitation services, which is why last week I introduced H.R. 3293, the Bipartisan Low Income Water Customer Assistance Programs Act. And I wanna give special recognition to my fellow committee member, Representative Debbie Dingell for her partnership and hard work on this bill. This legislation would establish a permanent program at EPA to help utility companies assist low income households with their drinking water and wastewater bills. It would also ensure that utilities have the necessary funding to make crucial upgrades to our aging drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. This is an unprecedented time and many families, particularly low income families are struggling to pay their utility bills. The ongoing public health crisis has heightened the importance of, and the important role of clean water that it plays in our society in keeping communities safe and healthy. As we emerge from the ongoing health crises, we need to work together to ensure that all Americans have access to safe and affordable water utilities. I'd also like to state that I have letters of support uh, for my bill, including from the American Society of Civil Engineers and U.S. Water Alliance and others, and ask uh, the chair for unanimous consent to have them entered into the record. Yeah, yeah. Representative Blunt-Rochester will be doing that at the end of the hearing, but uh, certainly. 
Thank you. Um, you spoke to the public health standards, Dr. McLean, during uh, Chairman Pallone's questioning. And we've seen how vital clean water is during a pandemic also in, in, in particular. How can a low income water uh, cons customer assistance program like the one outlined in my legislation help low income communities maintain critical water and wastewater infrastructure networks as well as meet public health standards? Thank you for the question. Water affordability is a real challenge across the country and reliable access to water is, is very important um, for public health. And we have seen the COVID-19 pandemic really deepen these two problems. And um, it is very important for people to have access to continuous water supply um, especially in a, a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic has, has been. And we, we support the efforts that utilities and local governments and state governments took during the pandemic to ensure continuous access to water because we know, we know the devastating impacts that can happen when there are access, um, when people don't have access to water, which we saw, for example, in the in the winter storms in, in Texas and in, and in Jackson, Mississippi. And we are, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, um, I know um, you were helpful um, as Congress provided funding, the $1.1 billion for emergency low-income household water and wastewater affordability program to be managed by uh, the Department of HHS. Um, can you uh, tell us, given EPA's history of helping set this up, um, does EPA have the capacity to quickly and effectively stand up and implement the permanent nationwide program outlined in my legislation? And as a follow-up, can you speak to your experience, EPA's experience in administering drinking water grant programs and assessing the affordability of drinking water standards? Thank you for the question. We are working closely with the Department of Health and Human Services as they implement the, um, the low income household affordability um, program that's been established. And um, we are working with them and learning from them. We have um, a long track record of implementing um, financing programs and funding programs, including the, the grant programs to help communities that need assistance with, um, with water infrastructure related um, issues. And um, if Congress um, en enacts such a legislation, we would be um, prepared to, to, to work on that. And we're happy to give you technical assistance um, in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services. Great. And I just want to follow up. Two of my colleagues, Peters and Barragon, also talked about climate change um, and just the frequency of storms making our infrastructure uh, upgrades even more costly. Um, how would long-term investments in water affordability programs contribute to resiliency of these communities? And I see my time has run out, but uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's a question I have for the for the witness. And we can submit that for the record. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I see you're using yeah. manipulate yeah. there. Yes, uh, you're most welcome. If the uh, if the uh, witness wanted to just quickly answer, she could. She Great. can, please. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, utilities are also also have also been struggling as well as individual homeowners. So having um, having programs available for utilities to help um, them maintain and operate their systems um, is can can also be a, an important factor. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence, and I yield back. Always, always. Uh, thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Florida, Representative Soto. Thank you so much for joining us. You have five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's clear that the American Jobs Plan will help address safe and ample drinking water for Central Florida and across the nation. We've experienced 20% growth in the region just in the last 10 years. And I represent over 930,000 constituents, the six most of any congressional district. Some areas we need new drinking water infrastructure to handle this growth. Other areas we need repairs like Orlando and St. Cloud where the infrastructure is aging. 
Other areas, it's about affordability. We recently had an apartment complex, Caribbean Isles, uh, that faced an unscrupulous landlord, and now individuals are faced trying to afford their water. In Polk County, in our rural agriculture areas, they're running out of water. And then add threats like climate change, intensifying hurricanes, rising seas with saltwater intrusion into our water systems, even cyber attacks. And we understand that risk and resiliency is critical. Just over in Tampa Bay, an Oldsmar city worker noticed something odd on his remote work computer one afternoon in February. Large amounts of sodium hydroxide used in cleaning supplies was increased in the city's water treatment system. The worker quickly took action. What had happened? There was almost a hack in that water system in Tampa Bay that would have poisoned uh, thousands of residents. So I want to focus my questions on the importance of risk and resiliency programs for water systems. Section 1433 of the Safe Drinking Water Act was created through bipartisan work on this committee. It requires water systems to assess and address their vulnerabilities to extreme weather and climate change, as well as intentional acts like the Oldsmore water system cyber attack. The work of this program is far from over, and I'm happy to see several bills before us uh, in this committee, including the Clean Future Act and the Aqua Act of 2021, which would double the funding available to help water systems address these vulnerabilities. Dr. McLean, what is the status of EPA's implementation of this program? I know the deadlines of the program have been phased in, so how much progress have we been able to make so far? Thank you for the question. Um, the um, resiliency of our water systems is a critical critical need, both from a di natural disaster standpoint as well as from a cybersecurity standpoint. And the risk assessment and resiliency program established under OWEA um, is um, has been an important program in requiring systems to do risk and resiliency assessments and make emergency response plans based on those assessments. We've seen um, very good compliance with the mandates put in place. Um, so far, the dates have passed for the larger, the largest water system um, and for the medium water systems for the for the risk assessment plans. And we've seen we've seen very good compliance and we're already seeing risk assessments come in for um, the smallest water systems and the deadline for that is um, in another month. Thank you, Dr. McLean. These water systems are developing vulnerability plans. How much money has uh, gone out the door so far uh, once uh, we've reached the implementation stage of the program? The um, under under OWEA, the program is um, a mandate for systems to develop the the assessments and the and the and the plans. We have um, financing available under our state revolving funds and other programs for systems that want to make changes to their system based on the plans that they've they've put in place. Well, thank you, Dr. McLean. Be able to supplement your answer total amount that's been spent so far on the uh, implementation stage of the program. I know the, the committee would be, that would be helpful for us. What other tools has EPA made available to water systems to help them adapt to climate change and address cybersecurity? Thank you for the question. We have a number of tools available for systems to address climate change. As I mentioned earlier, we have a specific technical assistance program um, creating um, resilient water utilities. Um, and we also have um, funding and financing programs available to, um, to help make those changes. With respect to cybersecurity, we have a specific um, cybersecurity program where we provide best practices and guidance um, to the uh, water sector. And we do this in collaboration with the water sector on um, measures that utilities can take to increase their um, countermeasures against against cyber attacks. And, and this is a voluntary program. Thank you, my time's expired. The uh, gentleman yields back and uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Representative O'Halloran, you're recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, Chairman Taco, I appreciate that. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. McLean uh, for joining us today. 
think uh, EPA is one of these agencies that uh, over the last four and a half years, I've had the uh, distinct uh, honor to work with because I have so much work in my district to be able to uh, address your issues. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, access to clean drinking water is a very important issue for families in Arizona. This is especially true in rural and tribal areas where water infrastructure is lacking. An estimated one in six households on the Navajo Nation do not have water piped to their homes. You will find the same story on other tribal lands in Arizona and throughout the Southwest. Over 100,000 homes on tribal lands lack access to running water and adequate sanitation infrastructure. It is an outrage that so many communities still lack access to clean, reliable drinking water here in the United States. Adding to these problems are environmental hazards on tribal lands that contaminate some sources of water. Addressing these problems requires attention and coordination across federal agencies. Uh, first of all, Doctor, uh, I'd like to ask you, in comparison to how much uh, work is needed to be done uh, just with your priorities and how your funding is, what percentage do you think you can meet of the ongoing need versus the ongoing funding? Thank you, Thank you for your question. I, I don't think I have a percentage for you today, but I am in agreement with you about the, the longstanding challenges in, in Indian country and the significant infrastructure needs. We know that there are um, many Native American households that do not have um, access to basic plumbing for wastewater and, and for drinking water. And we do work closely with um, Indian Health Services and other federal agencies to partner with um, with with tribes to um, to make improvements, um, particularly on this access issue, which, as you mentioned, is very important. Just last year, we were able to use the. Um, small and disadvantaged um, grant program as a. Um, provided by Congress to help make progress on this access issue on, in, in tribal lands. Thank you, Dr. McLean. Can you uh, tell us more about that role that you play in, in addressing those areas uh, and uh, to get access? Yes, thank you. So the the small and disadvantaged communities grant program that I was that I was just mentioning um, provided by Congress and has as a priority uh, underserved communities with lacking access. And this most um, in 2020, we used the the funds appropriated by Congress to address that as access needs in in tribal lands. And um, we will be, we've been announcing the awards as we've been making them over the over the past few months. Um, very excited to have um, the ability to put that program in place. And um, we work with our other um, financing programs very closely under the state revolving fund with the with the money set aside for tribal lands to address um, access and water quality issues um, in collaboration with um, Indian Health Services, both in um, for the for the tribal nations and for Alaska Native villages. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last question I have is. Uh, Administrator Regan was here uh, last month. Uh, these Superfund sites uh, that uh, of uranium mines up on uh, Navajo, a tremendous amount of them, uh, these Superfund sites impact the availability of clean drinking water for thousands of residents. Can you tell us how the departments within the EPA coordinate with each other and officials on the ground to keep clean drinking water a priority? Yes, thank you. I, I know that the, the, the president has prioritized a cleanup of, of mines and, and EPA definitely works um, within EPA across our across our authorities to address important um, drinking water issues, contamination of drinking water that can happen, for example, at a Superfund site is an important mitigation measure for improving the quality of drinking water in a, in a locality. 
And Chairman, I yield and thank you, Dr. McLean. Thank you. The uh, gentleman yields back. The uh, chair now recognizes the representative from uh, Texas. The gentleman has asked to wave on to the subcommittee. And so the chair recognizes uh, Dr. Burgess for five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. Uh, just say at the outset, I don't want to get into a long debate about this, but it, it, it does strike me as unusual earlier in the questioning when Mr. Johnson had his line of questioning restricted. Uh, this is a committee that has uh, often enjoyed a wide ranging jurisdiction, and it just seems to me for a member to be able to question an agency, uh, uh, agency personnel does not seem unreasonable. So I just register that uh, um, discomfort with the restrictions placed upon Mr. Johnson's line of questioning. So um, I do have a question on the uh, being a new class of underground injection wells for this enhanced oil recovery. Um, <clears throat> this uses carbon dioxide to more easily extract uh, the, the crude oil. So Dr. McLean, our current uh, enhanced oil recovery activities already regulated under the EPA's underground injection control program. Thank you for thank you for that question. Um, at, at this time, we regulate the sequestration of carbon dioxide under the class six UIC program. And under class mm -hmm. under the class two program, there are um, provisions as for um, uh, carbon di for sequestration of carbon dioxide with enhanced oil recovery. Yes. So is the EPA able or unable to safely regulate enhanced oil recovery under current law? We are we are we are enacting the statute as it's written today, and we will be prepared to work with Congress as as you consider changes to to those programs. We're happy to provide specific um, technical assistance. And we're grateful for the technical assistance, but again, the fundamental question: able or unable to regulate safely regulate enhanced oil recovery under current law. We are in in partnership with the states, and we are implementing the underground injection control program to protect um, underground sources of drinking water. Um, and we we are doing this today in across all of the well classes. Well, again, just begs the question: Is the EPA failed to protect uh, groundwater near enhanced oil recovery activity? I don't have any. I don't have any information on on that topic. That just makes you ask the question of why would a new regulation be necessary for enhanced oil recovery if mm -hmm. the EPA is adequately protecting groundwater near enhanced oil recovery activity? Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just ask you a, a question because and it's a little bit unrelated, but it does. We had a, a, a week of winter in, in February in Texas, and it uh, resulted in some uh, some lack of water in some locations. And then Hurricane Harvey uh, a couple of years ago, a uh, similar problem down in the Houston area. Uh, and <clears throat> what strikes me is that dialysis centers always seem to be terribly adversely affected by these types of events. Is there anything that you do in conjunction with other parts of the Department of Health and Human Services to ensure that dialysis centers have access to uh, the type of water resources that they need during the time of crisis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. The um, there are critical infrastructures like the like the healthcare um, like healthcare that are dependent on water. It's very important in an emergency situation. For those um, for those facilities to have access to water available to them, and we do work under the emergency response system in in the U.S. with the state and the local emergency responders to help them understand that um, that the water that the water sector is um, a, is critical in response in terms of getting it stood up right away and ensuring connections to those facilities that need it most. 
Yeah, right there. of course, typically those patients cannot wait yes. uh, much more than a day or two is, with an interruption in their in their process. Uh, and the type of water that's required is obviously highly purified and, and pretty specialized. But it's something it's worth paying some attention to because it does seem to crop up from time to time. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. Thank you for hearing my uh, my criticism at the beginning, and I'll yield back. Um, the gentleman yields back. Um, I believe that completes the list of uh, our colleagues who uh, chose to question the witness uh, at today's subcommittee hearing. Um, and I do thank our witness uh, for joining us. Um, I remind members that pursuant to uh, committee rules, they have uh, 10 business days by which to submit additional questions for the record. Um, and we would ask that um, they be answered by our witness um, and to respond promptly, please, to any such questions that you may receive. Uh, before we adjourn, we've had a request for um, several documents to be included in the record. So I request unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. A report from Environment um, America Research and Policy Center and U.S. PERG Education Fund entitled Get the Lead Out um, and Ensuring Safe Drinking Water for um, Children at Schools. Uh, a, a blog post um, from Environment America Research and Policy Center entitled No More Pipe Dreams, EPA Must Order Removal of All uh, Lead Service Lines. Now, a letter from 62 organizations to former Assistant Administrator Ross, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on revisions to lead and copper national uh, primary drinking water regulations, a letter from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies and the National Association of Clean Water Agencies to support uh, in support of H.R. Um, 3293, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Program Act of 2021, a report from New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund um, entitled Five is the New 15, a case for reducing the action level for lead in New York State's public school drinking water program from 15 parts per billion to five parts per billion. Um, a letter from the America Water Works Association, Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, National Association of Water Companies, and the National Rural Water Association. A letter from the U.S. Water Alliance in support of H.R. 3293, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Program Act of 2021. A letter from the American Society of Civil Engineers in support of H.R. 3293, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Programs Act of 2021. A letter from the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiatives Mayor's Commission on Water Equity in support of H.R. 3293, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Programs Act of 2021. A statement from Representative Veronica Escobar. A letter from the Water Equity and Climate Resilience Caucus in support of H.R. 3293, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Program Act of 2021. A letter from Green Latinos in support of H.R. 3293, the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Program Act of 2021. A letter from the Water Design Build Council. A statement from Representative Rashida Talib. A um, fact sheet from the uh, American Exploration and uh, Production Council on H.R. 1512, the Clean Future Act, a fact sheet from the American uh, Exploration and Production Council on the Safe Drinking Water Act, an article from Chemical and Engineering News entitled, There's No Need to Control PFAS, uh, as a class industry scientists say, uh, as uh, a letter from the Independent Petroleum Association of America, a letter from the Groundwater Protection Council, a letter from the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, a resolution from the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission entitled Urging the Federal Government to Work with States in the Spirit of Cooperative Federalism During Review of Our Federal Fossil Fuel Program, a resolution from the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission entitled Pertaining to the Clean Future Act and Any Substantially Similar Legislation or Policies. An article from Americans for Tax Reform entitled Clean Future Act Lays Groundwork for Backdoor Ban. Um, 
So those are the uh, requests. And do I hear any objection? No objection. So without objection, so ordered. With that, um, the committee is adjourned. And I thank everyone for their cooperation. And we are adjourned.